Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. As young kids, Travis and I were kind of known as the extremely honorary kids, almost the kids that parents warned, warned you to stay away from. We, I remember when we were in kindergarten, it was the only time they ever put Travis and I in the same class, and the teacher left the room to go get something. And when she came back, all the desks were pushed to the side of the room, and all the students formed a circle around Travis and I, and we were, like, fighting slash wrestling slash <laughs> not knowing what the hell we were doing, just, like, probably throwing fists and trying to kill each other. But We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today is Trent Paulson, coach at University of Virginia, twin brother to the great Travis Paulson. Man, Trent was a stud wrestler back in his day. NCAA champ three-time All-American, and then in 2009, he made the U.S. World Team, competing at the World Championships in freestyle. He's one of the best, and I'm really excited to see him and his brother Travis, as well as Coach Garland, doing great things in Virginia. Fan of the Week is my friend from Sweden. It's the most bizarre Instagram name of all time, I-O-J-P-J-2. I do appreciate you tuning in from the Swedish Alps, my friend. Thank you, sir. Last but not least, folks, this episode is brought to you by Assembly Fall. It's an audio documentary that we released last Tuesday. It's on the biggest upset in Illinois high school wrestling history. Go to 145 in the feed or just text IHSA to 555-888 and we'll send you the episode right to your phone. Anytime we do one of these audio documentaries, it requires a ton of time and work, so I would greatly appreciate it if you tune into this episode, even if you're not from Illinois, folks. That's it. I've said my piece. Here we can move on. Let's get to Trent Paulson. Peace! Trent Paulson, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we can make it work. Absolutely. Big fan of what you guys have going on out of Virginia. But I figure we could start, man. Take us back to Ames, Iowa, fall of 2002. You and your brother enroll there. One of the things I've heard about Bobby Douglas is that, one, he has a nickname for everyone, but two, what you learn just from your first couple encounters working with him is incredible. So take us back there. What do you remember from those early encounters with Coach Douglas? So Coach, what most, most people view Coach Douglas is this like big intimidating man that uh, is a legend of the sport, not to be questioned, but he's actually got a pretty good sense of humor and really good at giving you a hard time or being able to test you in a way that would increase your mental toughness. Uh, what sticks out in my mind, my senior year was Kale's senior year, 2002. He had just won his fourth title, and Heska won a title, and then I think Aaron Holker won a title too. And there was just a lot of excitement around the program. They just finished second in the country, and Coach Douglas had been the Olympic coach in the previous cycle, and there was just so much momentum that it felt like home when we were on the visit. And once we got there, I mean, I could be here all day telling Bobby Douglas stories. Let's hear a couple. But, Let's dive into them. <laughs> uh, so Coach Douglas, uh, he was getting up there in age. By the time He was in his mid-60s, lower 60s when he was coaching, and he would still get in there and, and get on top of Nate Gallick and ride him for a while and, <laughs> and put Nate in his place. Or he would be demonstrating a move and tweak something. And he, uh, he used to have us do this drill where you swish your feet and you put your back against the wall 
and then you do a somersault or a cartwheel with your back against the wall, but you don't use your hands. You land across your shoulder blades, and it was to simulate a, a technique he had when we sat out and they chopped your arm. And he did that once, and while he was rolling, he kind of tweaked his neck, and then he said he tweaked his groin. He goes, ah, gosh, dang it, <laughs> ah. And then everyone, like, doesn't know how to react because you don't want to laugh, but I mistakenly, as a freshman, laughed. He goes, what's so funny, Paulson? I'm sacrificing my body for this team. And just looked at me furious, and then I didn't know what I was supposed to do next, so I just got a straight face and just really paid attention from there. But Man. <laughs> he was – uh, another example, he would wear like Ugg boots all the time in the winter with no socks and sweatpants, or he would, uh, in the summer, he would wear like a fisherman's jacket with no shirt and unbuttoned and teach a <laughs> camp session and teach a camp session like that with like a couple hundred kids. And I remember he was, uh, either walking in or leaving a camp session and John reader and I were sitting there by the laundry chute and John goes, Oh, Hey coach, uh, are, are you going fishing? Like an honest question because he sees a fisherman jacket on he goes ha 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 real funny asshole <laughs> yeah. it's not like john was trying to bust his balls he was asking a legitimate question but you just never knew which reaction you were gonna get man his he has a sense of style on his own i guess you could say the boots yeah, the he, best the russian hats the really furry russian hats the the fanny pack the the whole night he didn't care he was <laughs> He was just trying to be efficient, but he was his own person. That's one of the things I admired about him. He, uh, he's like a guy who everyone you talk to about him has stories about him. And you know, a lot of people say that he's the greatest coach they've worked with. And what he did at Arizona State in 88 is just incredible. It doesn't get enough respect. I mean, what was he like in terms of when the going got tough? Was he someone that would come down on you? Or would he kind of soften up and, and try to get to know you? Like if you were having a tough go, like late in the season. I think he knew when to push athletes and he knew when to big, when to uh, back off, but he, he definitely go the toughness route nine times out of 10. And he'd like to try to test you mentally. I remember uh, it was like my, maybe I think it was my red shirt freshman year. I was cutting quite a bit, bit of weight to 149 and I was on bottom. I can't, I think Aaron Holker was on top of me. I can't remember exactly, but he kept saying hand control, hand control, hand control. And I kept standing up and fighting hands and I get my return. I keep, I thought what I was doing was fighting hands for hand control, but he just repeated that probably 25 times in a row, screaming it. <laughs> and I got to the point where like, I don't know what the hell hand control is, like what you're talking about. And then he just like make eye contact with me, get a big smile on his face and then walk away. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> he got you. He broke. You. Yeah. He got me. He got me. He's like, by breaking and yelling that he knew that I had lost my cool and to win at the highest level, you got to keep composure no matter what people are yelling at you. And it was lessons like, like lessons like that, that he did in live scenarios instead of just trying to talk you through it. That helped. Now, when you guys came in, you were super highly recruited, you and your brother. Um, some guys we talked to on the show, like coach Bono, you know, coming from Florida, he had a really hard transition. And even his first year in the lineup, I think he was, you know, had a really tough go at it. And he said that's a, that was a huge year for him, whereas John Reeder comes from Davidson. He's like, it was a tough transition, but we are ready. Where were you guys at on that scale coming in as freshmen? Uh, I don't think the transition was as hard for us. For I don't know if it's because we were physically mature for our age or Coach Massey did a really good job at Lewis Central. He had six guys go D1 in our class, and he had us wrestling at a pretty high level before we got there. But I remember getting thrown to the wolves right away with like Gallic and Harry Lester and Aaron Holker and all those guys. And uh, from the get go, we could compete at a pretty high level our first day in the room. And I, I think my true freshman year, I was 17 and one. My only loss was to TJ Williams in the finals of the UNI Open. And then my, uh, then after I redshirted when I was wrestling 49 in the lineup, I started the season out 20 and 0. I think I was ranked second in the country. I just, I had won Midlands. I got OW, but cutting to 49 I was cutting quite a bit of weight and I wasn't a very mature weight cutter mm. and I was yo-yoing a lot for the second half of the season it started to catch up to me and I think I think I was dang near 500 for the the back half I, I was 20 now that I was like 28 and 8 going into the national tournament I was still the fifth seed because the big 12 was so tough back then but I think we yeah I think we were at a, we were able to get in there and compete with the best guys right away for sure yeah 
I mean, you talk about that freshman year, you know, being f- seated fifth, you lost in the first round battle back, didn't get on the podium and your brother all American. I mean, how did that impact you moving forward? Was it something where you said, Hey, I knew I was cutting too much weight, no big deal. Move on. Or did it linger for a little bit? Uh, it definitely lingered. I mean, I was happy that Travis was an All-American as a freshman, but I knew I was capable of doing the same thing. And mm-hmm. when you don't accomplish your goals, you just it adds to the drive. But fast forward to that next season, they still wanted me to go 49 again because they felt like it was our best lineup. And I was like, honestly, Coach, I was like, I respect your decision, and I, I want to do what's best for the team. But I'm telling you, letting me go the best way for me is what's going to be best for the team because if you allow me just to be close to the weight class and feel good when I wrestle, you'll be happy with the results. And then. Coach Douglas was a cool guy where he wasn't set in his ways. If you really talked to him from the heart and kind of told your perspective, he'd give you a chance. He's like, all right, we'll see. You still got to certify. But if I like what I see and you do it, you do everything you can to win, then, I mean, I'll trust it. And then that season, uh, I took out the returning national champ, Gentry, at the national tournament. I think I was at fifth seed again, and I placed fourth. But Overtime, right? Yeah. Overtime. And it was a BS. It was a BS overtime because – in. The third period, they dinged me with for stalling. He had an underhook, and I limped armed out, and they dinged me with like three seconds left to force the overtime. And then when they forced the overtime, he stood up and started clapping, and I was like, all right, mother effer, you got a <laughs> gift, and now you're going to – I was like, now you're trying to clap it in my face? Let's go. Would you ever have imagined that five years later you'd be making 145 and a half? No. Absolutely. <laughs> I, was cutting, I was cutting a ton of weight my senior year of high school to 145. I remember my senior year – after that last weight, uh, weigh-in, I was like, I'm never seeing that number again. Thank God. I wrestled 160 at jun- junior duels that summer. And then uh-huh. I was dying to make 49. And then I was cutting quite a bit of weight to make 57 by my senior year. I, I was pretty lean walking low 70s. And d- at the next level with those jumps and weights and Travis and I both being probably ideal 74 kilo guys, one of us had to make a sacrifice. So I was like, I'll, I'll do everything I can. I, w- I was at the Olympic Training Center when I was trying to make the decision. At the time, Terry Brands was the resident coach. And I went up to him. We were in the weight room. And I was like, uh, Coach, do you think I could uh, cut down to 45? He, he looked at me, looked me up and down, told me to lift up my shirt, pinched my stomach. He goes, it'll be really tough, but you can do it. <laughs> and just walked away. And I was like, all right, well, I guess we're doing it. <laughs> That's science right there, baby. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's but, science and then zeke jones was a national team coach and he actually yeah he does the research and tries to help you use every resource so he put me in connection with the uh, taekwondo nutritionist that was helping a silver medalist get back down to a weight class that he had medaled at in the previous olympics and she was kind of ahead of her game in terms of methods and and ways to shrink the body so she helped me a lot God, that term shrink the body always gives me cringe as the reader here, but it's all too common in our world. Well, it sucks because you get to a point where you can't lose any more fat, so you literally have to use, lose muscle. And you obviously worked really hard to build that muscle. Yeah. So to lose muscle almost sounds foreign to a wrestler, but in that case, in that case, it's the only option I had. And for people who don't know what we're talking about, after you graduated college and wrestled on the senior circuit – you cut down to 145 and a half after winning a national title at 157 as a senior. And I, I was reading that on my index card. I had like five exclamation points when I saw you were at 45 and a half. I couldn't believe it, man. God. Yeah, it was, it was an extreme challenge every time I did. I remember one time um, I was in a, I was a double tour. It was right after the 08 Olympic trials. Um, it was probably a month after that, just a summer tournament. And Coach Brands took us to a tournament in Yakut, and I won that tournament. And then we flew to Moscow, and then the next tournament was in Kazavert, which is in the opposite side of Russia. I think it was like 10 hours of flying within Russia to go from uh, Mahachkala to, Kaz- or to uh, Yakut to Kraz- uh, Kazavert. Sorry. And when we stopped in Moscow, we did a practice, and after the workout, I stepped on the scale, and I was 18 pounds over the two-kilo allowance. And in my head, I was like, oh, it's a no-brainer. I'm going 74 kilo. I just want to turn him out. I'll reward myself, let my go, myself go up. And then Branch was like shaking. He's like, you're making it. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you say to Terry Brand? So I just, uh, I got in the sauna and he got the plastic suit out and he's like waving it. So there's even more heat than is naturally in the sauna. 
And then after he's weighing it, the suit actually gets extremely hot. He's like, put it on. And when you're putting it on, it feels like it's burning your skin. And he's like, stay in the top row, keep moving. He's like, if you can't do jumping jacks, at least rock. And God. the Brands Brothers, even though we were rivals, and it's like a hate relationship in college, I obviously still respected their careers, and they're well known for their work ethic and mm -hmm. get guys to believe for them. So he was a guy, even though he wasn't my main coach, when he was coaching me on a tour, I respected him and I listened to him. Well, I mean, when you guys were in college, to your point, you were on some teams that probably beat Iowa a couple times, right? Yeah, we beat – my freshman year, we beat him for the first time in 30 duels. And then the next year, we beat him for, for the first time in Carver Hockey and, like, Carver Hawkeye Arena and the first time – it was, like, some extreme – I can't even remember years, how long. Probably. Yeah. yeah something, maybe not 20, but, yeah, I mean, at least since, like, like the Gibbons era, early – late 80s, early 90s maybe. So – so, yeah, I mean, so those guys were the enemy, and, and so you're over on this trip. So I didn't realize you were making 45 and a half a month after the Olympic trials in 08? Yeah, that's, uh, that was like when the national team starts hitting tournaments to start the new world tri uh, title cycle. Gotcha, okay. And then I was just hungry because I got thrown at the Olympic trials. So back to work. I love it. Now, we're going to come back to the international career because there's a, a number of things we can hit on, but take me back to first grade, man. I've, I've come across a couple of blog articles where you are known as the AAU king, the original AAU king from back in the, uh, the Iowa U circuit days. How did you guys get into it, and what do you owe to the, uh, the progression and success you guys have had up through high school? I'd say we, as young kids, Travis and I were – kind of known as the extremely honorary kids, almost the kids that parents warned, warned you to stay away from. Mm -hmm. And we, I remember when we were in kindergarten, it was the only time they ever put Travis and I in the same class, and the teacher left the room to go get something. And when she, she came back, all the desks were pushed to the side of the room, and all the students formed a circle around Travis and I, and we were like fighting slash wrestling slash <laughs> not knowing what the hell we were doing, just like probably throwing fists and trying to kill each other. But it was ingrained in us at an early age. I don't know if it's because we were twins and we were always trying to one up another one, but our endless amounts of energy and always wanted to go at it. They had to put it somewhere. So it was wrestling. And then once we tried wrestling, there was no looking back. My first, my very first practice at the Panther wrestling club, which was a pretty good club. It was the feeder program for Lewis central. Uh, my, uh, but there was beginner practice and there was advanced practice right after that. My parents, they'd never really been to wrestling practice before. They're like, let's have him do both because he's trying something new. Let's let him experience it as much. So at the advanced practice, they had wrestle-offs for a duel that week. Mm -hmm. And it was the coach's son had the spot and they said, does anybody want to wrestle, wrestle him off? And I raised my hand <laughs> and they're, they like were almost laughing. Like, Puh. I was like, this kid that's never wrestled before is going to try to challenge the starting spot against the coach's son. And I don't even know how I did it. My mom said she doesn't know how the hell I did it either, but I beat him in the <laughs> wrestle up by like a point. And they're like, all right, you got the starting spot. You're wrestling in the duel on Friday. And I'm wearing like sneakers. Uh, I didn't <laughs> have any of the gear. I didn't. And I wrestled in the duel on Friday and I won that match too. And I started out just on the, in the starting lineup in the advanced group. My first day of wrestling, I just kind of kept going with it. Did Travis go with it too? He didn't raise his hand. I think he's kind of been following in my footsteps ever since. <laughs> he eventually got there, and we were eventually in the lineup together, but I was definitely in there first. Were your folks athletes? My dad played football for the Army, and my mom, um, I don't think sports are uh, too popular for women, how old she is. I don't want to date my mom, but she, uh, she's from a small town, Shenandoah, Iowa. Okay. And she got pregnant right after high school so she just started a family right away but first generation wrestlers though yeah yep i love that more more out there than you'd think um it's funny you said that about the shoes i i had eric tannenbaum on about a month ago he's an illinois guy i went to Michigan, i know eric obviously. we used to be at the olympic training center the same time in high school and him and travis used to scrap back in the day really okay he talks about wrestling. His dad, his dad actually started him at, in freestyle. Like his first season was like a summer freestyle and he did socks the whole summer. And so I always <laughs> loved hearing about you and your shoes. And did you at least have a singlet or did you go out there in shorts and the t-shirt? Uh, yeah, it was the shorts and the t-shirt for sure. I think I got my first singlet that the day of the duel. That's big times, man. Um, and so from there, what you guys just loved it and did it 
as much as you could? I mean, when did you start going like year round and really getting obsessed so with it? So we started year round in seventh grade. And I remember being pissed because I had all this success in folks. I'd never trained freestyle. And my mom's like, you're training freestyle. And we're like, I'm like, no, I'm not. And she's like, that's the style they wrestle in the Olympics. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try it then. And our first freestyle tournament, it was in Council Bluffs. I think it might have actually been at Lewis Central. And in my first match, I had someone that I always beat. I had never lost someone folk style. And I wrestled him in freestyle, and he beat me. He kept tilting me when I got on shots. And I was lost in positions. He out-freestyled me. And I remember walking off the mat just pissed. I was like, you freaking made me do this. Now I lost to that kid that I always kill. This is bull crap. She's <laughs> like, well, you said you said you would try freestyle. Now you're sticking with it. So I wrestled that whole summer and got the hang of it pretty quick. And then I think in eighth grade, we were all Americans of Fargo. And just kind of went from there but it was it was hard at first but once you get o at, over that little hump of your small mindset of folk style you actually like it more and you had a, a real penchant for greco was that something that was conscious or you just happened to do better in the greco tournaments uh well i think our our coach keith massey was pro greco because his brother uh i um, his his older brother that passed away is it lou massey I'm not sure. I'm not familiar. Lewis's with dad. Show. I can't remember his, if his older brother was named Lou as well, but he uh, was an Olympic alternate for the Marines, I believe. And so Greco was a big thing with the Masseys. And then Zach Dominguez would come back in the summers, and he had been at the Olympic Training Center for Greco, so he was really passionate about that. So Greco was in the summer was just as much as of our workouts as freestyle. And then back then Fargo, Greco was always first. Mm -hmm. So you were pretty much doing Greco because you could do get more matches in yeah i mean you you went out there you won it i mean one year it was travis got fifth i think cp i don't know if it's cp dow or cp schlater but he got third you won it I mean, yeah it was cp schlater and then it was uh a utah kid that i had in the finals it was travis had tore his acl that year and he got the surgery right after um the state tournament Red for state duels, I believe. And then they told him it takes five to six months to recover. And he wrestled at Fargo three and a half months later with a brace. <laughs> and they said, he shouldn't do this. And he's like, I'll just wrestle Greco because they can't r grab my legs. And he got fifth in my bracket. And then we got back home like a few weeks later, we were wrestling again. And he told me to do something. I was like, so you can't tell me what to do. You got fifth in my bracket. <laughs> and then he was like, you bet. <laughs> then, I, then we're throwing blows and going at it. But. We knew what to say to push each other to a high level, and he's like, that was just one example. It's crazy to think you guys almost split up a couple of years ago when you were going to go to Wisconsin, and he had gone to Virginia already. Like, was yeah. that a done deal? It, it's just the, deal, the avenue I was leaning towards because they were going to make me an RTC coach, and they had a relationship with Athletes in Action. So okay. I thought I could use that as a platform to uh, just kind of to um, further the faith and and – use that platform for good not just specifically wrestling but expand on that and it seemed like a good fit at the time and then travis kept saying before i committed to wisconsin to fly out there because virginia has a lot of wealthy donors and they were trying to fundraise a full-time rtc position mm -hmm. and i was like i'm not gonna move across the, co the country for hoped fundraising money i got a couple kids uh but it, it sounds cool. I was like, you're probably BSing me anyway, but it's it, well, a month later when the opening came and I flew out there and I saw how awesome Virginia was, I was like, for once, Travis wasn't BSing me. This place is sick. It's so, it's beautiful out there, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a hidden gem. It's one of the top places to retire. I, um, I'm a mile and a half from campus and I got almost a four acre lot. It's pretty heavy timber. And I mean, there was a bear in my backyard the other day. There's, uh, there's huge rivers that go through town where the people flow or kayak. There's wow. huge lakes. There's um, we're two hours from the ocean. It's sandwiched in between the Blue Ridge Mountains, so there's you can go extreme rock climbing if if you're into that. It's just there's so much more thing you you can never really be bored if you like to do stuff outside because there's so many outdoorsman out activities. Well, and plus the school is one of the top public schools in the country. Yeah, that's when you sandwich in the number one public school or pu public. Uh, academic degree in the country that offers wrestling it's us in cal berkeley every year we've been in the top three for the last 30 years but <laughs> when we saw the campus which is insane uh the president's debating on the center of the lawn the 
the historic people that have uh, graduated from the university and what they've got, went on to do were like, and they're in the middle of building, when we took the job, they're in the middle of building a $180 million Olympic sports complex where we'll have a four, four, uh, four um, full mat room, a recovery center with a hot cold plunge and just a wrestling room that'll be within the top 2% of teams in the country. What does that I, I bad like, boy do? Or is it done? Uh, so they said three to five years and they were heading into three year three this year with COVID. And now we're hoping that it doesn't get slowed down too much, but mm. they've already broke ground and they've already cleared, uh, blow up, blown up two buildings. They, they're, they're quite a ways into the process. Well, and plus you got the Steve Garland effect, man. That guy yeah, Steve, he's infectious. We always say, use your lips. He's such a good public speaker. We like act like we're putting on lipstick and put it around our lips. We're like, Steve, use your gift. He's like, screw you guys. But he's really, he, he's, he's, Steve's just an awesome guy. So what, uh, we've had Travis on, but it was a really long time ago. And so it'd be worth rehashing, you know, kind of how all this transpired. You were at Iowa state, you had taken the interim head coaching job heading into the postseason, And you see Steve speak at a breakfast. What happened from there? So we saw Steve at the breakfast and he just did an amazing, amazing speech. And he talked about how he had a, a twin brother as well, how life decisions, um, he took one path and his brother went on another path and his brother ended up doing seven years in jail for uh, drug trafficking and through small decisions, how they can make a world of difference. And then how, even how he had taken a good path on paper, uh, making an NCAA final, getting a dream job of his own matter. He was still fighting a lot of demons. And when he got on his knees and heard the good word and tried to stop doing everything on his own, that's when things that everything started making connections and his life finally took the direction that he'd always hoped for. And when he used that story, the stories he shared to get to that point, there are stories that you would tell like a best friend or a sibling or someone close to you. He was sharing this in a room full of 300 people. And he knew, I knew the purpose of his story and the vulnerabilities that he shared were to people wrestling tough people in the sport of wrestling that always try to do stuff on their own or try to figure it out mm -hmm. and the whole message was you don't have to figure it out on your own you have a savior that died for you that i mean use that i All was right. getting the word he's like i'm a degenerate animal that has literally done everything under the sun and was borderline psychopath and here i am telling all you wrestling legends what's what and obviously that radical change doesn't happen uh unless there's a real Holy Spirit out there, but when we we really gained a lot of uh, respect and admired Steve after that speech. But obviously, when you give a speech, you can sound great on a speech, and then you can be a different person behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's been a blessing, being at Virginia, Steve Garland is he is who he says he is when no one's looking. He um, he's empowering. There's no ego there. Um, it's cool to be a part of a staff that's like-minded in the sense of priorities, uh, goal-driven, and all the same mindset. And you're not always going to agree on a staff on everything, but if we have a disagreement, we address it right then so there's no bitter feelings or no uh, nothing that ever builds up. And that's kind of one of his gifts, and it's been really cool to be there. It's his, his part of the story where he talks about, to your point, going the JUCO route, I think it was like Central Connecticut State. Yep. Something yeah. ridiculous. Central dude. Connecticut, yeah. It's like, is that made up? I don't even know that's a school. Um, but then he, to your point, makes it to the to the NCAA finals. I think he beat like Strip Matter and whoever it doesn't yep. matter, whoever it was. But then like you think, all right, that's the peak of the story. He gets a job. He's working with Rob Cole. Then he gets a job at UVA. But I remember him saying, and this sticks in my head because I have a tendency to work way too long and put other things to the side. But he was like working out of a hotel room, 18 hours a day, had no relationship with his family. And his, yep. like, his life was heading down the wrong path, even though, to your point, you thought he had already made it by getting out of the situation where he grew up in a tough spot. But like, you're always in these constant peaks and valleys of up and down. Yeah. And it, it's kind of where you put your value. He, he got national coach of the year, assistant coach of the year at Cornell because they brought him from worst team in the country to fourth in the country in four years mm -hmm. and that set him up to get his dream job and he um was kind of pounding his chest saying like this is all me this is from my hard work 
Uh, I'm going to kill it, Virginia. I already know the resources they have and what you, they have academically and how hard I can sell it because I can sell anything. But when he was going through that process, he tried to do it all on his own. He tried to be on the road. I'm going to out recruit everybody. I'm going to outwork everybody. When people are spending time with their family, that's when I'm going to get my edge. And like you said, he was living out of hotel rooms. He was dying for the job and not dying for his family as well. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where English and the girls were packed in the van and they were going to leave him. And that's when he hit his knees and he's like, I got to make a change and this is serious. And then he was, he's like, he's always like, go figure. I go to my knees and I ask for help. And then all of a sudden the program changes. He's like from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And it's something I could do on my own. It's, I, yeah, I, I just didn't have to do it on my own anymore. And that just, and that resonated with you guys because you're at the Thursday or Friday morning of the Nationals. You're not even thinking about going to Virginia. You probably never put more than a second of thought in Virginia in your whole no, life. No, the, the only thing, uh, our senior year, uh, he paid Kale, I think, a couple of grand to fly Iowa State out there. We were ranked second in the country just to duel Virginia so uh, he could get some fans in the seats because he was having a hard time building momentum. And it was probably a bad idea because I think we all, they won one match maybe, and I think we had bonus in all the other matches. And I remember thinking in my head, I was like, man, I was like, I was like, that coach is pretty energetic. He seems like a nice, nice guy, but that team sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's cool. I, I had that mindset of Virginia. Then when I actually gave it an honest look, I was like, Virginia is freaking awesome. You just got to bring the right guys in. And, and just, he had already built the culture and he's, he's done a phenomenal job. When he got the job, they had scored zero points in the national tournament. And then four years later, they were top 15 in the country. And then the next year they were ranked ninth. And then a couple of years later, he won two ACC titles. He's just, He's one of the unsung coaches. You always hear the same names over and over again that have built these dynasty teams. Mm -hmm. But I'd, I'd put Steve Garland up there with any of those coaches. He just doesn't market himself the way a lot of other programs do. Yeah, I mean, think about who he's learned from and Rob Cole, you know, one of the, the true program builders. Cornell was at, you're, you said it earlier, at, I mean, they were nothing. And then he built them up. So he's learned from someone like that and you know, now he's mentoring you guys. So it's exciting. And it, wrestling in general in the Southeast is on the rise. I mean, you know, V Tech has got a great program. There's some great, great schools out there right now. I mean, what's it like compared to Iowa when you're going to these high schools doing high school recruiting in Virginia and the Southeast? Are you seeing some momentum? At the height, there's definitely some studs in Virginia. One thing shocking about Virginia, they don't have wrestling at a lot of the schools at the middle school level. Hmm. So it's all clubs, and then they get to high school and start making a name for themselves. But it's definitely – it doesn't have the same attention or prestige that it has in the state of Iowa right now, for sure. I, I mean, I, like wrestling at Lewis Central being a top program of that team, I remember when we dueled Scott Catholic, who was the top Nebraska team at the time, we had like 2,500 or 3,000 people there at a high school duel. Yeah. I don't – there's lucky to be that many people at the high school state tournament in Virginia. Gotcha. But there's also six classes and it's watered down a little bit. Six classes. Yeah. We got to yeah, get that so, fixed. That's exactly. crazy. Yeah. That's what I, yeah, that's what I think every coach agrees with that, but six man. Yeah. That's, um, and in Georgia there's eight. Oh my God. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys going around at the bar saying they're state champs in wrestling out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And around Robin. Right. <laughs> With no district. You talk about when you were at Lewis Central, I was looking at the stats, man. One year, you guys had six finalists, and you, uh, you beat Iowa City in the duel. I mean, was, that had to be a pretty big one too, right? City High? Yeah, we actually, uh, at the Comet duels, I think they were in Charles City, we beat City High in the semis, and then the finals, we beat Apple Valley, who was actually a powerhouse. They were ranked like top five, and we beat them like 40-something to 20-something. And that's wow. at the time where we got ranked the number one public school in the country. And I think we were only behind uh, Blair Academy and Clovis or something like that. And we would have liked duels against those guys. But Iowa has that stupid rule where you can't travel over 300 miles. Mm. That's got to be lifted, too, because I think a lot of our top Iowa teams would do great and get more recognition nationally as powerhouses. But we can't travel. I didn't know that. Actually, funny you say that, because the only time you see them in an elite semi-national tournament is the clash and they used to travel up to chicago there's a big tournament called dvorak but that's actually only iowa city because they're you know obviously i was a big state so there's no way that chicago would be within 300 miles of where you're at so yeah so um, when we had those great teams uh they were inviting us to go to top national tournaments around the country 
and Massey's like, I would freaking die to go to those tournaments, but this, the state of Iowa won't allow it. And he's like, it's, it's not a national rule. It's a, it's a specific Iowa association rule that you can't travel a certain amount of mileage. Yeah. That's, I didn't, I kind of forgot about that. Some states still have that. Hopefully, uh, Illinois just had forever. We had a rule. That's where I went to high school, right on the quad city border. Um, but we had this rule where you could only do four tournaments a year and they just lifted it and just put a straight match limit on it. So you could only have like 50 matches, but you could have 10 tournaments if you wanted. So it, I just think fewer restrictions is better when it comes to that kind of thing. I mean, Michigan still can't do it. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it just you, hurts the athletes. And it, if, if some of these kids could go to these national tournaments and beat a top ranked guy, it'd give them opportunities at the college level, mm-hmm. but they don't get seen because they're only wrestling Iowa kids. And the, the ones that, don't wrestle free song Greco that are great folk sellers don't get seen because they're a smaller class state champ and they haven't been noticed at the national level. So they just don't get noticed. Well, I don't follow Fargo that closely, but from what I hear, it's not like where back in the early two thousands, everyone was going. So with that, like, how do you guys start your recruiting process? Do you look at super 32? Do you look at the top 50 on the rankings? How does that work when you're trying to bring it down into your, your focus group? Uh, so for us, super 32 is a big one. The only thing we don't like about that is the shorter periods. Mm. Like the constellation matches are a joke. They're like a minute each period or something crazy. I I guess you have to do that with the larger brackets Mm -hmm. and Fargo now is definitely more watered down than what what it used to be, but it's still a great indicator of guys that will perform at the next level. And then we're at, um, Akron for the UWW, Mm -hmm. uh, cadet trials because those are usually the top guys. And then the juniors is usually guys that are in college or top high school kids that are in Vegas at the same time. So we're there. And then coach Garland always hits the beast of the East and the, all the close tournaments that we can just drive to the PA tournament, the Ohio tournament, the New Jersey tournament. So gotcha. You kind of whittle it down from there. Yeah. And then if there's a specific guy that we've been on for a while, we'll go to that individual state and watch him at the state tournament. Gotcha. I mean, so you've, you've learned all these recruiting tricks and tactics from from a number of great coaches and one of the things I found interesting was your senior year you had a new coach at Iowa State in Kale um he started what the spring of your soft or your junior year he was the assistant coach my junior year but he became the head coach this summer right right like a week after the NCAA tournament my junior year gotcha I mean obviously curious to learn about that transition but more specifically what did what was something Kale did that you think he picked up from from Bobby Douglas that you know maybe he's still probably using to this day just that you saw um i'd say mindset training uh having the mindset to score points not being fixated on results but having a mindset not to get don't focus on one technique focus on moving him, watch where his feet go, using drills that create scoring opportunities as opposed to myopically zoning in on one technique, and this is the only thing you can hit in this situation. More play wrestling and figuring out positions when you get there based on your body type or based on what works for you. Having the mindset that there's no such thing as a stalemate. Mm. You're just always wrestling to score points. The emphasis on taking focus away from winning and losing versus the scoring seems to be a constant with a lot of great wrestlers, but certainly that program. Yeah, for sure. He, uh, he had a standard that if you want to put on the eye on your chest, that you need to wrestle the score points. And he did a really good job with that building the bonus point from previous years. Cause we had a lot of really, really good guys, but sometimes they wouldn't be as dominant as they could be. And I mm-hmm. think he, he had, a, he did a really good job of changing the mindset. So because obviously bonus points is a difference at the national tournament for a lot of the top teams. For sure. He also brought in a pretty interesting staff. I didn't realize that Cody Sanderson was at Utah Valley, I believe it was, before he came to you guys. And then he brought in Hartung, who was at Iowa beforehand. Right? Yeah. That, that, was, that, uh, was, there any, was there any tension there? Was there any you know, a rub between that? Uh, there wasn't too much tension. I remember Hartung is one of my – favorite coaches ever he's hilarious he's awesome he's personable he he's just a good dude but I remember at the banquet for our first experience with him um he was wearing a yellow tie and it was tucked into his sports coat and he was given a speech and then he pulled out the, the tie and it had the the Hawkeye thing on it and he untied his tie 
and like took scissors and cut it up or crumbled it up and like threw it down and stomped on it. He's like, I'm here to take those guys out and like gave <laughs> this big rah rah speech. And then everyone's like sitting on the edge of their seat, like, who is this guy? He's crazy, but this is awesome. Man, but he, is- yeah, him and Kale being the same size, he kind of was a surprise hire, but I think he, Kale had gotten to know him really well, training for the Olympic cycle with him, and he just knew how great of a coach he could be. Were you going out to the OTC during that 03, 04 time when Kale was gearing up for the Olympics? Uh, so I had gone to the OTC since about 1999. They started those big brother future freestyle programs. So I was like in the kids' practices while they were doing the, like the senior level practices. And every once in a while, like later in high school, they would pull us and let us be dummies for drill partners or kind of spar around with the senior level guys. But I wasn't actually in those national team type practices until probably 2005, 2006-ish. Got it. So who was your big brother in the program? Uh, they, that's just, that was the name of the program, the, the big brother. Yeah. But – it was, I know yeah, if you, get, I know if you got Bennett. paired up with somebody. Okay. Now, after your, you know, we mentioned your senior year, Kale came in, he was the coach. You guys got second in the country. And on the back of two dudes who wrestled way out of their seed, Bacchus and Varner, man, they had a great tournament. You guys got second. You won. Your brother had his best ever finish. At that time, did you know you were going to wrestle at the next level? Yeah. That, that was one of the things that actually drew us to Iowa State was – a lot of the coaches were saying all the great things about the program, but Bobby Douglas's pitch was, I'm not going to sell you on four or five years. I'm selling you on eight years. As you know, I was just the Olympic coach. I've coached this many medalists. Um, Kale's going to stick around to train for his cycle. So you can see how it's done at a high level. And um, you guys are so good that you guys are going to, I'm going to pour into you at the next level. So, and you won't have to move to the training center. You won't have to move for coaching. You'll have every resource you have. Wow. Laid it out right there. I mean, and so you guys stuck around, and then it, we talked about it earlier. You cut down to 45 and a half. 09, you make your first world team. And then in 2010, what went into the decision to go up? You just couldn't, couldn't do it anymore? So, yeah, the weight was literally – I think I came close to death a couple times. It was just so hard. Like, even doing the perfect diet and doing double the amount of work on the track and getting extremely lean, I was probably – seven percent body fat at 175 so oh. shrinking that down and com- going even lower it was just i literally looked like a skeleton travis like has pictures back from those days and still makes fun of me with the way i look there was a couple <laughs> times like before wayne's he'd like grab me he's like are you okay you literally look like death and i'm like get the f away from me don't touch me like because <laughs> <laughs> obviously when you're cutting that much weight you're really irritable but uh it was yeah it was really 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 hard I mean, even if, like you said, let's say you're doing like, per, you have a 12 week camp, perfect diet, two workouts a day. I mean, you're still what you were like 165, 170. So, yeah, it was mainly when I was training, I walked around 170, 172, and I'd be slightly uncomfortable in the 60s. I was always in the 60s after a hard workout. But if I was in the 50s, I was hurting really, really bad. And if I was anywhere in the 40s, I'd be like, extremely extremely hurting <laughs> <laughs> and i remember and i would like plan it all out like how much i had to lose what i could put in stay hydrated eat low sodium food so i wouldn't retain water but still get enough calories to have energy and at the end i would still i'd sit in the sauna for like 30 minutes with uh all the oils and people slapping me and putting on plastic suits before i could even start sweating and you can't start the clock until you actually start sweating because that's when you start losing weight so even 30 minutes in, that's when my clock would start. So it'd be real tough. Would you be on the bike in there or are you just sitting there at that point? Yeah, the, yeah I'd, I'd do cycles. I, I'd tie myself for specific things in and out. So what, you're in there at 30 minutes, it starts to cl- the clock starts ticking. How long are you in there for at the, at the worst? So time? when you start the clock for the first drip, uh, when you first drop a sweat of uh, a, a tear of sweat, uh, I'd start the clock at between 12 to 15 minutes and just keep moving the whole time. And then it'd start rolling pretty good. And then I'd take like a three to five minute break. And then I'd go back in for 10, then a three to five minute break, and then three fives, and then another one minute break, and then a couple threes. Oh my God. I mean, that would have been impossible with the same day weigh-in, right? Oh yeah, there's no way. No way. That's... I mean, 70, 70 kilos would have been hard on a same day weigh-in. Man. 
man. So, I mean, and was your brother, was he cutting a lot to get to 74? Was that his ideal weight? Uh, that was his ideal weight for sure. And when, when I moved up in 2010, I was like, I don't care if we have to wrestle. I was like, I'm done doing it. I was like, we'll just figure it out. So then when we made the finals of that tournament and yeah. it's, it's in counts of bluffs, we had flipped a coin before that and taken turns and we're like, we're not flipping a coin for the world team spot. So we went at it and he, uh, he beat me. So he's never let me live it down since he has like a mantle of his arm getting raised uh, <laughs> over me and uh, above his bed. And <laughs> <laughs> no, he's been pretty humble about it, but I... it was, uh, no one knew to cheer. Like we had like 75 close, like family friends or fans there. Like you could hear a pen drop. It, it was, and then after we walked out of the match, I'll never forget. My parents were like crying. They're like, never do this to us again. We're like, calm down. It's just a freaking wrestling match. Like, <laughs> By far the out. most awkward match I've ever watched in my life though. I, uh, yeah. I didn't know it happened. And I was, I read an article and it was from 2010 that you guys had wrestled. I'm like, Oh shit. So I went to find it. And yeah, lo and behold, you know, you guys freaking went out there and wrestled a match with it all on the line. And, you know, and luckily your brother went on to win and he made a world team. So in back to back years, you guys have made wor a world team. Um, before we let you go, I want to hear about the time you and Herbert and your brother went to the Minsk OTC. <laughs> so it's pretty normal for uh, like USA Wrestling to send a team, like a, a full class of guys to co compete at a tournament. Mm -hmm. But they weren't sending a team for the training camp. They were just going to send people to Minsk like a day or two before the tournament and just wrestle and get out of there. Like, screw that. We want to wrestle with all these Olympic level guys. Send us there early. So I think we wrestled, yeah, I think we wrestled in Ukraine. And then we went from Ukraine to uh, Belarus, and it was just the three of us. We didn't have a coach. We didn't have a trainer, nobody. And we didn't have a translator. We didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> so we show up to um, Minsk, and we're like, uh, we're like, they like kind of look confused. Like we're like pointing, like <laughs> we wrestlers, like <laughs> trying to use apps, but apps weren't that good back then. And luckily we found a Russian that spoke a little bit of broken English. And he figured it out for us and we got our rooms and you get in the rooms and it's like a tiny, tiny dorm room with two beds that look like they're smaller than twin beds and they're two feet apart. And there's like, uh, there's like couch cushions as the pillows with no pillow sheets. So if you hit the cushion, dust just flies everywhere. <laughs> and we're like, Travis is like a germaphobe. So he's like, oh, I'm not sleeping the next couple of weeks. But uh, <laughs> he just put a workout t-shirt over it. And then you go in the bathroom and there's a, a garden hose coming out of the wall with no uh, cover, just a garden hose, and no shower wall or anything. So you put your thumb over it to spray cold water on yourself. It's getting all over the toilet paper. Like, the whole room just gets soaked anytime you want to shower in your room. And this is like a hotel or just like the, uh, the training It's like their, it was their training facility dormitories oh. that were de in desperate need of renovations. or I'm not sure, but... Um, Shoot me yeah. straight. A garden hose coming out of the wall? Yeah, the literally. A, a green garden hose coming out of the wall about six sensors is just flopping there and you can just kind of <laughs> guide it with your hand and put your thumb over it. Like it was, I, I thought it was like when Ashton Kutcher was doing that punk series, I thought someone was going to come around the corner and like, you've been punked, but <laughs> no, it was real. We were roughing it. And we just jumped in the, and we're at the practices. No one's translating English. So they're like, he'd be yelling all these things and maybe show a move or like, and then they just blow a whistle. Then all the wrestlers were like spreading out and doing it. So we just kind of had to like a person would point at you. You would point at them you'd give a thumbs up and then, you didn't know if you were wrestling or at wrestling live. So you would like kind of start play wrestling. Then all of a sudden they would arm spin you pretty hard. You're like, all right, I guess we're going now. <laughs> that was your signal. <laughs> so you guys, you three just jumped into practice. They didn't, did they know you were coming? The so they're, uh, I'm not sure that they knew we were coming, but once we got there, there was national teams from Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, obviously, cause it was at Belarus. Um, yeah. so it wasn't just USA versus Russians. It was like, 10 different countries at the training camps and it was two weeks a full two week cycle before the tournament so we got to wrestle 90 percent of the guys that were going to be in our bracket and it was a huge learning experience wow that's cool i mean luckily at the camp the there was a few canadians there actually and the canadian coach was from moldova so he spoke russian and english and that was like our saving grace once we got to a practice and became friends with him and were you friends with herbert before you went over there yeah, I mean, Herbert and I were on the U23 world team in uh, Mongolia, and we had connected before that. We've been pretty close for quite a while before that. Gotcha. Okay. I didn't know if you guys had – it just kind of randomly paired up there or what the story was. But, 
I was like, man, two weeks at the Minsk Olympic Training Center or the Belarusian Olympic Training Center. What the heck is that? I remember Travis uh, was fighting the gut and he popped a rib out and he like couldn't take a deep breath without sharp pain. And we have no trainer. All they have is that like cold spray crap that doesn't do anything. So our only option was to uh, take a water bottle, freeze it in the freezer, and then uh, just wrap a ta- uh, push a t-shirt against, like tie a t-shirt around his side, <laughs> just have the frozen water bottle against it for a week. Jeez. And that was the rehab before you scrap them with tough guys. Again, science, baby. Science at its yeah. best. <laughs> well, man, we won't keep you much longer. I, I greatly appreciate the time. Um, you know, last thing we always wind down with is how did wrestling change your life? But before we get to it, I have to ask. You went to the World Championships in Russia, the motherland of wrestling. What Do you have any stories or any memories just from how cool that experience must have been in, in 2010? Because I'd imagine you went with your brother, right? Yeah, I was his training partner. Yeah. Um, we've had this close family friend, uh, Gennady Kolesnikov. He, uh, we met him back in like, I want to say 2007, 2008 ish when we start, first started going overseas to these different training camps. And he was just a young kid that spoke English that loved wrestling. So he would literally meet you at team USA at the airport and say, Hey, I speak both languages. Just take care of my travel to wherever you're going and I'll be your translator. So we're like, heck yeah, this, I mean, wow. that's how we literally became friends with him. And when they were in Moscow, that's his hometown. And so he was showing us around, uh, some of the cool nightclubs, some of the, top wrestlers that weren't wrestling at the tournament um took us to different gyms and then obviously moscow the red square where stalin still preserved the whole he took us throughout all that and i always when you walk around there's all these like really pretty women usually blonde hair blue eyed and they're all have like this like dead serious look like you like try to smile at them or wave at them they just like stone cold like walk right past you like (laughs) It's funny. They, they walk around like they're pissed off 24-7. I'm like, gee, why they do this? And he's like, because they think you Americans are all like John Wayne. I was like, what the <laughs> hell does that mean? <laughs> Is that a bad thing? The Duke? Come on. Yeah. That's a compliment. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just I can imagine that. I mean, Division One Nationals, the crowd, I'm sure, is, is as good as it gets. But I didn't know if there was when you walk into an arena where so in the arena it's funny because the iranians are always the loudest team like iran Iran." and then iran iran they put them in like the furthest back back nosebleed section of the entire tournament (laughs) so like their whole backs were against the back row and you could hear them like blowing their horn and like doing their little chants but it was only like 10 percent of what it typically was at an international tournament i thought that was kind of funny because it was always at that time russia and iran being fighting for the top spot right yeah that was in the dark era of the ball drop right yeah <sighs> unbelievable we're in we're in a better place now um well man it's been like i said it's been a pleasure when you look at your life through the sport and you you and your brother because you did it th- together i mean what sticks out is some of the things that you're you're using this day that's fundamentally changed your life or improved how you work with your athletes or your coaching game you know whatever it is I'd say, like, the, you asked me earlier, like, one of the things Kale changed, it was changing your mindset instead of result-based to how do I score points. Just changing, uh, like, you have the top wrestlers all the time from high school and they get to college and it's not as easy as it was. They start second-guessing themselves because the, the field's a little bit uh, more level or they're not, they're not uh, used to being challenged at such a high level on an every single day basis. And when you just change a simple mindset of how can I get 1% better each day or what, what's the purpose of me wrestling because I love to compete, because I love to test myself, when you can ground them back in why they love the sport instead of, oh my goodness, I've built this name so there's pressure involved now. When you remind them that the only pressure that they can have is the pressure they put on themselves and just simplify things. It mm-hmm. just makes it so much easier. And just kind of sharing your experiences on how you were overcome. You were able to overcome composition, competition anxiety and just kind of also like the, the places wrestling has, has taken me. It, it helped me be able to get through school without debt. It helped me go to 15 different countries, training for an Olympic cycle. It, um, it opened up friendships all over the world that I'll always cherish. It, and just the, the brotherly bonds you get in the sport. It's, they're like siblings. They're not just like acquaintances. 
Right. Even if you had a teammate that you don't talk to on a weekly basis, you could talk to him five years later and it's like you were in the locker room yesterday. It's just a bond that that can only be made through blood, sweat, and tears that I, I guess it'd be similar to the bonds that are made in the military when guys are fighting overseas. It's just like there's an extreme brotherhood there that you would pretty much do anything for that individual just because of what they were they were willing to do for you when you were fighting a goal together. Absolutely. I mean, and you've had it now at, at, at several schools. We had talk, even, didn't even get to talk about Nebraska, but I wanted to ask you about that. But, but yeah, man, I mean, you're doing that now for these kids. So hopefully there's a season next year. Excited to see you guys back out there. And, and man, let's, let's get Jack Mueller this match he's calling for. Is he going yeah, yeah. he he, to do he, it? Yeah, he, he's dying to do it. He, he, I don't think he's heard a response yet from his hopeful opponent, but he's, he's game to go toe to toe with anybody. He wants to wrestle the best guys and test himself. He's always been that way. Well, they were saying, uh, I did the commentating for the fight TV rumble on the rooftop, the North Oliver one that happened two weeks ago, and we're going to do another one. So if, if he's still, if he's still game, I can, uh, I can let the guy yeah, I'm know. Sure, yeah. I'm sure. I can connect you guys too. I'm sure he's more than game for sure. That'd be great, man. Well, uh, awesome. We'll hopefully follow up on that and we'll talk again soon. My friend. Sounds good. All right, take care. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Come. 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 Take care, y'all. Come.